to episode 38 of the Five Reasons Podcast. I'm Ethan Skolnick here, as always, with Chris Whittingham. We have decided to break from format here for, well, the next week, two weeks. We'll see how long this goes. Heat fans certainly hope it goes a little bit longer than it looked like it might go as we watch the game on Saturday night. But basically what we're going to do is do a podcast after every game and leading into the next game. So this is the podcast that we're doing after game one, looking ahead to Monday's game two. We'll be doing another podcast right after the game on Monday night, and that will be up overnight and into Tuesday morning. Before we get to some of the specifics of this podcast, I wanted to, to sort of make some announcements related to the Five Reasons Sports Podcast Network. A lot has happened over the past week. If you've been following us from the beginning, you'll know it was just us for a while. Then we added the Three Yards Per Carry podcast that focuses on the Dolphins. We'll be ramping that up as the Dolphins head into the draft here at the end of April. Then we added the Balls Cast podcast. That one's with Chris Joseph, Adam Smoot, and Kevin Mayer. You can find that one now on iTunes. You would prefer you call him Slim. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. I'm not supposed to call him Kevin. Well, we call him Slim, but he's not so slim anymore, so it's, <laughs> it's sometimes easy to forget. Easy um, hot shot. But you can find that also, uh, and their first two guests were Dolphins president, Tom Garfinkel, and they had former Marlins president, David Sampson, as you've never heard him before, actually. Um, you might actually like him, which uh, I think a lot of people uh, didn't, but but he comes across as uh, very vulnerable in that podcast. It's definitely worth listening to. But then this week, additionally, we added the Miami Heat Beat podcast. You may be familiar with them. They've been going now for the past five years, actually, but they have joined the Five Reasons Sports Podcast Network. They have a collection of very smart people and very engaged fans. You find them all over Heat Twitter on Heat Game Nights, and they are now part of our network. So be looking for for additional things from them in terms of you know not just their podcast, but also check out their website at heatbeatmiami.com. They'll be posting a lot of content there. And one final thing here, Chris, we're going to have a, three chats this week on our Twitter account at Five Reason Sports. That's a number five, Five Reason Sports. We'll be having Ask Slim. That's from Ballscast Monday at 12. If you missed that one, be sure to catch the Dolphins ones. Uh, two three yards chats this week. One with Simon Clancy at 6 p.m. on Tuesday and one with Chris Kaufman, Ask CK, the second edition of that one at noon on Wednesday. All right, now that we've sort of disposed of all the Five Reason Sports Podcast network news, Let's talk about the Heat. I put it off as long as I could, Chris, because it was pretty <laughs> ugly. Uh, in, in game one, uh, a 130 to 103 loss. It started reasonably well, with the exception of the fact that the Heat seemed to be playing at the Sixers' pace. So the Heat scored 60 points in the first half, but I was never quite comfortable with the style that they were playing in this game, and particularly with the way that four of their starters played in the game and whether it was sustainable for them to be able to hang with Philadelphia the way that those four guys were playing. And let's start here, Chris, with number one. You talked up the way that the Sixers had played during their 16-game winning streak. Half of those wins without Joel Embiid, they were without Joel Embiid in game one. You talked it up. We then went on the Miami Heat beat podcast, and they slapped you down for that because they said, well, they didn't beat anybody. The Sixers didn't beat anybody during that streak, right? They beat, what, three playoff teams mm -hmm. in 16 and, games. And they, and they beat a lot of the Tankapalooza teams as well. Correct. So you started to – we talked about it a little bit after you went on their pod, and I wouldn't say you were completely turned here from your Sixers in five prediction, but you had a little bit more hesitation about the quality of the way that the Sixers were playing down the stretch of the season. And maybe it was sort of a little bit overrated. After seeing them last night and what they did uh, against the Heat in Game 1, how do you feel now? I just think that, and, and actually, in some respects, I really credit both teams for the quality of the basketball. I think, you know, before the game really got out of hand in the fourth quarter, I thought both teams, from an offensive point of view, there were times much more than the Sixers that the Heat got bogged down, but Hubie Brown was mentioning in commentary how he kind of mentioned a few things over and over again, and one of them was how many baskets by either team were assisted so it was kind of early in the second and he went the Heat have made 14 shots and 13 of them were assisted the Sixers have made 15 and 14 of them were assisted so it's just for me the movement and the off ball stuff and I think some of the underestimation becomes comes from not having seen these guys perform in the playoffs before and not really knowing what these guys do I think maybe you look at Dario Saric and you don't know what he does but 
incredible three-point shooter, and all night long, the thing that, and we're going to get into the white side thing in a moment, but the thing that really, for me, ended him and, and really rendered him useless in the game was the off-ball movement. That is what Philadelphia does so well, and that's what Hubie Brown kept picking out over and over again. That off-ball movement, there was a three towards the end of the third quarter, might have been early fourth, when J.J. Reddick comes off a pin down, and the pin down didn't, doesn't come sort of you know, near the spot where he took the shot. It comes on the weak side, down on the block, where I forget who the screener was, takes out Wayne Ellington, and he's 25 feet away from J.J. Redick without even the slightest chance to get in the direction of J.J. Redick. So for me, it was the movement and the shot making that they have teamed together with Ben Simmons, who what he did to Kelly Olynyk was just insane. The crossover and then throwing down the dunk. And then he had the moment where he pulled the Kelly Olynyk. Kelly Olynyk's move all year long has been fake the handoff, drive to the basket and, and, and finish. And while I don't think he got on the first time, I think he tipped in his miss. But I just think you see the quality of their offense, the quality of their movement. They are really well coached. They are extraordinarily well coached, and we talk about their decision to keep Brett Brown through all of the losing. This is why, because you could see this under the surface, that even those Sixers teams that didn't have any talent, or at least any developed talent, and I kept criticizing them for not adding any veterans all those years to at least show the young guys the way a little bit, but even those teams were extraordinarily well schooled. The other thing that we've talked about a lot was the two additions that they made during the season, and it's, it's safe to say, and this was I said this before game one, they won the in-season acquisition game this year. Uh, you could talk about what Cleveland did and reshuffling that roster and having to blow the thing up, and we'll see how that plays out now as the playoffs go on. But what Philadelphia did without giving up anything, and usually, look, buyouts typically don't work very well. I mean, I, you go back to, to some of the Heat's uh, buyout situations here. Mike Bibby, Ronnie Turioff wasn't really a huge help. Who was the guy? There was a, there was a guy in year one where it yes. was devastating that he went to, oh, it was, uh, was it a he Murphy? Was it Tro- Troy yes. Murphy. Troy Murphy. Come on! <laughs> Yeah, uh, did, yeah. Didn't like, he go? To, didn't he go to Boston? Yeah, I and think? it was devastating that he didn't go to Miami in the buyout market. Right, and Troy Murphy is the. I mean, if you look at Troy Murphy, you'd figure he'd go to Boston. Like that's that's probably <laughs> where he was headed. He looks like a Celtic. He looks uh, like a Celtic. He did, um, yeah, he ended up going to he ended up going to the Celtics and averaged a whopping two point six points per game in his time with the Celtics. So we always make such a big deal out of this, and and usually the buyout players don't really contribute anything. For them to get two guys in Bellinelli and Ilyasova, who so perfectly fit what they're trying to do and also are not that old at this stage. Like, they're not broken players. I mean, they pretty much do what they've always done, right? Like, Bellinelli was never a great defender. Pop used to get on him all the time when he played in San Antonio. So you're not expecting that from him. But as far as being a crafty player who can find spots, work around screens, make shots from the outside, he still does that. And Ilyasova has an inside-outside game that allows Philadelphia to do what they did with him last night, which is Brett Brown decides to go with him at center, to start the second half. And that, I thought, you know, we talk you know, about what happened to Miami as far as pace and as far as the ball movement and everything else, but that also discombobulated the heat because when you went to Ilyasova there, there's really, and we're going to get more to Whiteside here in part two, but there's really no reason not to pull Whiteside from the starting lineup to set, start the second half, except for the fact that I think Spolscher doesn't want to lose Whiteside mentally for the entire series, especially whenever it is that Embiid, finally plays. And as we tape this, uh, we found out recently that Embiid is not going to play in game two either. But the fact that you have a player in Ilyasova who you can stick in there as a center to start the second half, and he's going to give you, not only give you outside shooting, but he's also been historically over the course of his career, a pretty good rebounder. So you can play with him as a small ball five. That's just a huge addition for this team. And so they always have three shooters on the floor Uh, with Redick, with Covington, with Saric, With Ilyasova and with Bellinelli, that's five guys who are plus three-point shooters. And you go back to the really good Heat teams, and at most they had, what, maybe four, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we always talked about how many they had, but if you had, say, Mike Miller available with Battier, with Allen, you know, and maybe when Chalmers was on that you had maybe four of those guys that you could spread the floor with. I um, mean, obviously, Bosch developed that part of his game, so maybe you even had a fifth. LeBron got to a respectable point with it, too. He did, too. He did, too. But what I'm talking about is having those guys around a player like LeBron, around a player like Simmons, who is who is a creator and always having at least three of those guys on the floor. And when you look at Simmons assists last night, a couple were spectacular, but a lot of them were easy. Right. And he ended up with 14. 
And the other thing, you look at Philadelphia from last night, everybody on the team, and this will happen in a 27-point win, but everybody on the team, but I think T.J. McConnell was a plus last night. So they got contributions when everybody was on the floor. And look, I don't want to crown them yet. I watched the the Milwaukee-Boston game. You clearly can see the path that Brett Brown was talking about Mm -hmm. in terms of potentially getting to an Eastern Conference Finals. You can see a path maybe even beyond getting to the Eastern Conference Finals. You can just see with Philadelphia what the formula has been. Now, what's going to be interesting is when Embiid comes back, because we know he's not going to be back for Game 2. But does that affect what they're doing at all in terms of their pace for starters? Because they've been playing at this lightning pace, particularly without Embiid. Also, if you look at Simmons' numbers without Embiid since the All-Star break, there are plus 10 per 100 possessions with Simmons on the floor and no Embiid on the floor. And that was a big problem in the first half of the season. They weren't very good with just Simmons and not with Embiid. So they've clearly learned how to play with Simmons as their trigger and then having three or four shooters around him. The other thing about the, the shooters, there's a bit of a myth that Bellinelli and Ilyasova have traditionally killed the Heat. It's actually not true. If you look at their statistics, they're both under 40% overall against the Heat over the course of their careers. But Dario Saric has killed the Heat. Okay, I mean, you go back <laughs> to last year and a couple of the games that he had, and then you look at the way he's played against them this year. We talked about him a lot on the preview pod. And then you look at last night, 8 of 15, 4 of 6 from 3, 20 points, plus 26, six rebounds, three assists, one turnover. I mean, he destroyed them last night. And they don't have a good answer for him. Because if they're going to start Josh Richardson on Simmons, as I expected they would, and they did last night, then you've got James Johnson on Sarge. And it just seems like Sarge is finding his spots against James Johnson. And James Johnson's physicality is not bothering him. So that is an issue going forward. Yeah, and by the way, I checked uh, the the Sixers this year were about three possessions slower in terms of pace when Embiid was on the floor. So I don't think it'll make that big of a difference. The number that I actually played at, which is 100.37, was about the number that last night was played at. So I don't think the pace makes that much of a difference. To me, and this is going to sound crazy because I think Embiid is a top 10, top 15 caliber player and is a vital part of what the Sixers do. And I think you saw, particularly when the Heat go for 60 in the first half, they missed him at times from a defensive point of view. But to me, the thing that it allows you to do, him not playing, is put that pressure on Miami to figure out a way to get White's out on the floor because really the only time you can do it is when Amir Johnson is on the floor, which is why Brett Brown comes out of the halftime interval and says... We're going to throw Ilyasova at center, and we're going to put you guys under pressure. And the thing that Whiteside just can't do, and to be fair to him, there aren't a ton of centers who can, is make them pay, right? Whether it's in the post, whether it's on offensive rebounds, whatever the case may be, if you frazzle him on the defensive end, he's not going to make you pay by getting a guaranteed bucket. Because we know, obviously, threes for twos generally doesn't work, but... The way that you can at least make them pay a little bit is by really guaranteeing that every time you go down that he's going to score or that he's going to overpower his way in. And he didn't do that, which is why he became functionally useless. And we're going to get to that here in part two. And that is the Hassan Whiteside situation and what the Heat do from here, what Spolster does from here. So he plays only 12 minutes last night. He only plays two stints to start the first half, to start the second half. And again, I, I believe that if Spolster wasn't worried about losing him mentally for the rest of the series and knowing that he's going to need him at some point against Embiid, that if you're Spolster, you go with Olenek to start the second half against Ilyasova. It just makes too much sense from a matchup perspective. And you knew, and we're going to touch on this in part three, that that starting lineup was not going to work against the starting lineup that Philadelphia threw out there. It didn't work for the first few minutes of the game, and it clearly wasn't going to work once you took Amir Johnson out and you put Ilyasova on and, and, and it went from not working to disaster. It went to disaster. They lost the game during that stretch, basically. Okay, it it got away from them, and you could see it happening. And that's the question here for Spolster. And I want to throw this out here. I put a few polls on our Twitter account, at 5 Reasons Sports, and I just said, Joel Embiid is out for game two, meaning the Sixers will go with either Amir Johnson or Ursan Elisovia. Who should start at center for the Heat? This is how it came in with a pretty sizable chunk of voters. 50% Olenek, 32% for Bam, 18% for Whiteside. So at least with that sample size and based on what I saw on Twitter last night, the fans are at the point where they think that maybe it's time to sit Hassan down. And if you're going to do that, then 
my thought is that it would be more likely that Spolster would start Bam because you know how Eric feels about his, his bench rotations, right? He has always tried to preserve a bench core, even if it's meant throwing someone in as a placeholder in the starting lineup. And even though Bam didn't play especially well last night, I think he had one rebound in 21 minutes, I could see a scenario where this series goes on where maybe he does decide to play Bam and just get Bam out relatively quickly and you know, allow Bam to use his fouls or whatever you need to do there, and then a Linux going to play 30 minutes a night. Like I could see that happening in this series. The problem is once you do it, right, Chris? Yeah. You have lost Whiteside. Okay. I think it's safe enough to say that now. We've had th- what is it now? Three years of this, right? Where you can kind of gauge how Hassan's going to react to certain situations. Like I thought Hassan played some of the best best basketball of his career. During the stretch of the of the fifteen sixteen season, that he was coming off the bench every game with Richardson and Winslow. Like for whatever reason, he didn't like it. Okay, and he tried to hide from the media that he didn't like it, and then ultimately it came out, of course. But he didn't like it. But he played really well with sort of that young group coming off the bench. His numbers were terrific. And then Eric put him back in the starting lineup before the playoffs, and the results were a little bit spotty. So in that situation, he did stay engaged while being a bench player. But I think at this point, with everything that's happened this year, with his minutes being cut, if he puts him on the bench to start a game, I could see a scenario where he just doesn't play him much at all, where he just goes to Bam and then Olenek. What would you do for game two? I think you match him up. Whenever Amir Johnson is on the floor, you put him in the game, and when he's not in the game, you take him off. And you put you, you put a little bit of the own. Now, obviously, Amir Johnson's not a pivotal part of what the Sixers are doing or anything, but he plays 22 minutes, and if you're not giving him minutes, then you have to figure out a way to distribute that somewhere else. And if it's playing other guys more minutes, then they're going to get more tired, and, and maybe you can use your depth to an advantage. But I think that... If the Sixers come out and start Ilyasova in game one, then you just can't. And you watch it happen in the start of that second half. The two big plays to get them going, one of them was they run the horn set, and Hubie Brown picked this out on the, on the broadcast, where you know it's the double screen at the free throw line, and they run right side through both of them. And he's got no chance. Like he's just he looks like a lost puppy in the middle of in the middle of the floor and it leaves Ilyasova wide open for a three. Bang. The other one was, like I mentioned earlier, that backdoor cut in behind Whiteside where he's just kind of standing and he's at the elbow, right? And that's so far from where he normally stands that you can just kind of see him like, I don't know where do I go, do I step out, who do I defend, how close do I get to him? And in the middle of all of that kind of what do I do, Ilyasova is running past him and it's a layup. And that's just I don't think that in the space of a day you can coach Hassan Whiteside on how to defend small, particularly when, and this has been a subject of ire from Heat fans for years, which is when you put him through pick and rolls or when you put him in situations where he's got to step out, he never steps out because his instinct is to stay home or to try and stay closer to the rim because he views his role as rim protector. So, If Philadelphia is going to come out and play a lot more small, then Whiteside cannot be on the floor. The other thing about this is that you talk about Whiteside's primary role as a defender is rim protection. But if you look at Philadelphia's roster, they don't have a lot of rim attackers on the team. You have Simmons and you have Fultz if he's going to be playing you know, heavy minutes. But a lot of their other guys, you talk about Redick, you talk about Bellinelli, Ilyasova, you know, for the most part, uh, they're going to they're going to run stuff to get them open from deep. OK, and, you know, spray from deep. And so I don't know that Whiteside's role in there as a rim protector is quite as valuable as it might be against other teams. And the other thing that is not his fault. All right. You talk. We're talking a lot about defense and, and that was part of it. And there's a couple clips, as you mentioned, that are circulating on Twitter that are not very flattering. But offensively, a couple of problems. One is, if you're going to play the game at a relatively fast pace, he doesn't have time to get post position. There were a couple of times where he just ends up setting up in the mid post instead of getting deeper. And one of those, he got stripped for a turnover. They basically just ganged up on him completely. And and so I don't know. You know, we talk about he's got to punish them. I, I don't know that the Heat know how to use him even if he's at his most effective, to allow him to punish anybody. They don't have anybody on the team other than Dwayne who throws a good entry pass, right? I mean, yeah, dry, uh, J- Richardson blew a lob to him last night. 
Right. So uh, if he's not on the floor with Dwayne, and we've talked about the numbers with Dwayne, like it's interesting because, you know, Dwayne is the one person who seems to know how to feed him. But Dwayne's numbers with Whiteside this year, since Dwayne came back, are not good. So I don't even know that that's a solution. So they just don't have a Chris Paul type who's going to know how to get the ball to the big to allow the big to create a play there. And so you talk about it defensively and offensively. He's just sort of, as you mentioned, sort of out of his depth in this series, and yet I keep hesitating because I know at some point Embiid is coming back, right? And Philadelphia may hold him out another game longer if they win game two and give him another game sort of to make sure everything's okay. If I okay. was Brett Brown, I would just be like, take your time, big, big fella. I, if you don't want to play with the mask and we can hold off playing you so you don't have to play with the mask or maybe you get more comfortable playing with the mask, take your time because – until the Sixers enter a crisis mode, ah, it's one game, right? So maybe they go and right. lose game two and Embiid get out there. But he cleared the concussion protocol. If he can get two days, four days, six days, however days it takes to get more comfortable wearing the mask for the rest of the playoffs and the Sixers can continue to apply the pressure of playoff basketball, that for me, and we talked about it in our series preview, is the best part of playoff basketball is the stress of something that you built up for 82 games being wiped out in five. And we saw that or in, in, in five minutes. We saw that for Whiteside and everything they tried to do all season. It got wiped out in five minutes by one mm-hmm. matchup change. And you can just put that pressure on, and you saw it straight away. The heat folded when, you know, the, the, the second that Whiteside was out there with no center on the other team. Yeah, and so my question then becomes if – if Brett Brown decides to hold and beat out and then say goes to him, you, let's say Philadelphia is up 2-1 going into game four, right? Let's say Philadelphia wins game two. The Heat play well on their home floor. We've seen that over the past couple of months. They'll be energized. It's the first playoff game for Dwayne in a couple of years with Miami. So they're going to be excited about it. And let's say the Heat win game three. Then you're in a situation, Embiid comes back in Game 4, you're going to need Whiteside in Game 4. And so what happens between now and then, and how does Spolstra handle it? Other than just saying, look, if it's not working, I'm going to pull you after six minutes, and we're going to go to somebody else. I mean, you you could tell at the very beginning, like you said, it wasn't even the Ilyasova change, although clearly that cemented it. But you could tell in the first three, four minutes of the game that it just wasn't going to work for Hassan. That it just, again, they were having trouble feeding the post. As you mentioned, Richardson had one stolen when he tried to get it into him, and he just didn't look comfortable in the game and he didn't look particularly energized and you just knew and I said at that point this is going to be a game Hassan doesn't play the fourth quarter I didn't realize that he wasn't going to play the second quarter either and that he wasn't going to play for a large chunk of the third so it is difficult for Spolster to balance it. And I just want to make clear, like every time this comes up, there's this thing, oh, you're hating on Whiteside again. I think there are things that Hassan does very effectively when he's into it. I just don't know in this series if Embiid is not playing, as you say, I just don't know what the role is for him. All right, let's get to uh, let's get to part three here of the podcast because it wasn't just Hassan. And we're going to touch on Dragic here a little bit later, but I wanted to get to the rest of the starting lineup because if you look at the starting lineup that Spolstra went with last night, it just hasn't been an especially effective group. This group of Dragic, Tyler Johnson, Josh Richardson, James Johnson, and Whiteside, and the only guy who played reasonably well last night, and it was really only in the first half, was James Johnson. The other four guys all struggled, like gave you nothing offensively. Now, Josh Richardson at least was chasing Ben Simmons around and had some good moments there. But this group for the season was a minus, okay? Not a huge minus, but they were a minus in terms of what they did together as a group. And both times last night, the first time they allowed Philadelphia to get off to a good start and then the bench came in, Olenek came in and changed the dynamic and the Heat went in the lead. And then in the second half, they got off to a terrible start and made it impossible for the bench to do anything. They're not going to pull Dragic out of the starting lineup, which is why I'm waiting for him to part for part four because they don't have another option, right? right. Even if Goran's not playing well, they're not going to start Justice over Goran at the point. They don't really have a backup point guard. We've talked about that all year. So the only other two changes that they could potentially make would be taking James Johnson out of the starting lineup. And again, I thought he did some pretty good things last night, particularly early. He was aggressive offensively. The other option is to pull Tyler Johnson out of the starting lineup. And when we had Ira on the pod, he talked about one of the most confounding things of this season, Chris, is that Tyler Johnson just put the contract aside here for a second and the fact that he's going to make $19 million a year next year. Tyler Johnson, the one thing you could count on from Tyler Johnson and the reason they liked him so much was that you knew you were going to get tremendous effort 
from Tyler, but also you felt like his game was getting incrementally better all the time. Like he was, he was getting better as a driver. He was getting better as a ball handler. He was getting better as a defender. And it just seems like this year, all of that has reversed. And last night, again, they just didn't get anything from their starting two guard spot. And it sort of made you pine for Dion waiters a little bit, which I didn't think I was going to be doing at this stage of the playoffs. What do they do with those two spots? Would you keep the Johnsons in the starting lineup or would you make a change? I think when you look at the way that that offense works, I think it's all interdependent. I don't think that you can necessarily point to any one of them and say, well, this player didn't play well on the night. I thought Tyler Johnson was fine, to be honest with you. To me, it is always about, does this team execute at the highest level? And there are just times, by virtue of no one of them being that standout, I think the reason why you were pining for Deion Waiters is because he does something different. He does something that is totally independent of everyone else in the team. At times, it's infuriating. But at other times, when you're just stuck in the mud and you need something, it's really useful. I don't think, I mean, James Johnson has a little bit more proficiency in terms of his size, allowing him to get closer to the rim and have that power in his game that I don't think anyone else in the game does. But I think with Richardson and with Tyler Johnson and with Dragic and with Winslow and with their sort of this group of wings that they have, none of whom are individual standout players, the offense needs to work for them. And so I just think at times Philly, and this is where I think you get into the section where you credit Philly defensively. Yes, they gave up 60 in the first half, and, and so you are kind of reacting to something smaller. But I think where they have an advantage, and, and, and the Dragic section will cover this as well, is because they start a six foot nine point guard, their smallest player is JJ Redick, and they put Ilyasova out there, and they put Sarich out there, these big dudes with big arms. And I think and, and I heard Zach Lowe talking about this, he makes an excellent point. The strength of Miami is the drive and the kick, the drive and the kick, the drive and the kick, over and over and over again until something bends to their will. And I think the size that Philly has defending allows them to, number one, cut off those driving opportunities. And I think that really stymied the Heat offense at times was Dragic not being able to get around guys because he's just they're just bigger than him. And we thought that might be an advantage. It is a distinct disadvantage in this series. And I just think you saw that their drive, their drive and kick game was a bit negated now this is again with the caveat they scored 60 points in the first half so it was it, it wasn't all bad but I think at times the size that Philly can hit you with negates some of the things that Miami does from an offensive point of view all right now I agree with you about the size and we're going to touch on that more here with Dragic because I thought it affected him more than anybody else but I would make a change actually in the starting okay. lineup um, and, and the change that I would make would be I would put Ellington in I would leave Whiteside alone for right now because, uh, again, I, 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 I am afraid of losing him for the whole series. I just think you have an extremely quick hook I don't, I, I with think, him. I think this game is too important, I, and, I, and I understand Spoles. He's not, he's, he's not going to do it, Chris. I, no, I just, no, no, I understand, but, he, but my point is, is that the NBA playoffs, the playoffs in any sport are about you have to be ready at a moment's notice to throw out your game plan, and I think it is time to throw out the game plan because Kelly Olynyk has been a better player all season. Kelly Olenek was a better player in the game yesterday and is more of a matchup fit for this series than Hassan Whiteside is. And I think that you can't sit around and wait until it's 2-0 and you're down double digits in the second half to all of a sudden scrap the game plan. And I think Spo is willing to do it because he yanked Whiteside after four minutes. And you saw he cursed on his way to the bench mm -hmm. and he was pretty livid about it. But I don't think you can have time for feelings. I don't think you can have time for politics in series that are this important. But we've seen with Spolster. I, I, look, I agree with you on principle. Would you um, do it? Would you do it? With Hassan, knowing that Embiid is coming back at some point of the series and that you haven't lost a home game yet, I would probably put Hassan back out there for game two, but I would have an extremely quick hook. And if you get the same kind of effort – from him again that he doesn't play more than 10 to 12 minutes and you let that be the end of it and like I said you go to a Linux quickly and you play with those lineups and you try to keep Whiteside as engaged as possible he's, he's not going to be happy about it he's going to be even less happy if he doesn't play at all and at least keep him somewhat in it for whenever it is that Embiid comes back because again you haven't lost I mean basically they've, they lost a game in game one they were supposed to lose they lost to a team even without Embiid that lost 16 straight games on the road first playoff game in that building in what six years uh, 
so I'm not stunned. And, and as you said, they were competitive in the first half. I mean, they were leading. So, and they scored 60 points in the first half. So I don't know if you're at that point where you just totally throw it out and throw out Whiteside. But I do think you can make a tweak to the lineup to make things easier on Hassan and others. And look, I put this on a poll, too. We got more than 1,500 votes on this poll. So people are engaged on this topic. And if you made one change to the starting lineup, what would it be? What do you think was the, the change that people picked? Well, I think Whiteside at this point is probably the one yeah. that, that's drawn the most criticism, yeah. Yeah, 43% Olenek for Whiteside. 26% Bam for Whiteside. 17% Ellington for Tyler. 14% Winslow for Tyler. Now, you, you would go with the one that people picked. You would go with Olenek yes. for Whiteside. I would go with the one that was chosen third here. I, I would go with, with Ellington for Tyler for this reason. I think with this starting group, you need to create more space, particularly if you have a couple of things happening here. One, Dragic getting choked off, which we're going to talk about more in a second, where he's not getting to his spots. And several times last night, he had to circle back, which is that thing that he does when there are too many arms in there, and he had to circle back. So they're not, as you talked about, they're not getting to their driving kick game in a traditional way. You also have Josh Richardson, who is just – been really inconsistent offensively now for like we're going on three months okay and, and and he's also charged with the toughest defensive assignment on the team so I don't know how much you can expect from Josh offensively at this stage and what was he one of I think one of seven last night Correct. so so you have that you have James Johnson who made his shots earlier but is not the kind of player that teams respect from the perimeter and then you have Whiteside clogging up the lane I think to add Ellington who is obviously their best three-point shooter by a pretty wide margin Origin, okay, in terms of volume and in terms of accuracy, to get him out there and start running some sets for him to create some space, put Tyler in the backcourt in the second unit with Dwayne, so you have an additional ball handler there with Dwayne to take some of that burden off, and maybe Dwayne can then be a little bit more aggressive offensively. I thought Dwayne played like a patient game. I just didn't notice him that much last night as we have in the past. So I, I would put Tyler with him in the backcourt. You still get some space with Dwayne because Tyler can make a three, but I think at least putting Ellington in the starting lineup gives you a chance to get off to a better start. The other option is to go with Winslow, which doesn't give you any space, but you put you put Winslow in the starting lineup and move Richardson to the two, you have three three no, guys. I, you can play Winslow, Johnson, and Whiteside together. Well, that is well, a that, calamity. I, I knew you were going to say that because of a space issue. So that that would be a bit of a problem. And then I guess you have the problem too, where you know you don't have anybody to bring off the bench to guard Simmons once once those guys go out because you got all three guys that could guard him in the starting lineup. So I would go 14% of people picked Winslow, but I, I would go with the one that 17% of people picked. Put Ellington in the starting lineup, put Tyler on the bench with Dwayne, still give Tyler some minutes, but allow him to trigger the offense a little bit more often uh, along with Dwayne. I think that gets Dwayne off the ball a little bit more, which I wouldn't be bad to get Dwayne involved in some cutting and to maybe go that way. But I, I think my gut on what Eric's going to do is nothing because we've seen this before from him in the playoffs. It typically takes a couple games before he decides to make a decision like that. Like, if you go back to when Bosch got hurt and he was filtering through Dexter Pittman and Roni Turioff and all those guys, I mean, that was by necessity because he didn't have Bosch and they didn't have anything that worked. And then he decided, oh, well, I'll put, I'll put Shane at the four and see how that works. And then that led to Bosch at the five and Shane at the four. But we also saw in the, you know, the biggest mistake that, that Eric ever made in his coaching career, in my opinion, in the playoffs, was the decision not to go to Chalmers in the 2011 finals after Berea was put in the starting lineup by Carlisle. And I think it took, what, three games for Eric to go it wasn't, to— It wasn't until game six, was it? Right. Well, yeah. uh, Berea was put in the starting lineup, I think, in game three, if I recall correctly. So he waited until the very end of that series, and then and he, he kept the corpse of Mike Bibby out there yeah. against him. And Chalmers had a big game six. It wasn't enough, but it kind of made you think, okay, what if they had done this a little bit earlier? So my gut here, Chris, is he's going to stay with what he has for I'm, now. I'm, I'm just a bit disappointed that we're losing Mike Bibby for our Heat Stories podcast. He's going <laughs> to listen to this and know that you called him a corpse. <laughs> <laughs> he's in the big, he's in the big three now. So so we'll we'll see which of us is right on that. Mm -hmm. But you so you think he should start a Linux yes. before we move on to part four. Will he start a Linux? No. 
I think that's been Spo's mo, and I think it's why, as much as you know, every every NBA pundit ever has said that Eric Spolster is one of the best coaches in the league. They're coaches that get frustrated with him because fans scream at their television or vote on Twitter polls and say, "Hey, we want a Linux starting over Whiteside," and Spolster's like, oh, "Hang on a minute, I'm not I'm not throwing everything away that happened over you know this last representative sample. I'm not changing, particularly as much as he talks about identity. I'm not changing identity." for one game after one performance after one half of that's really what it was it was a half it was a quarter and a half of basketball that went wrong yeah i think he's and i I think again he's worried about losing white side all right let's get to number four here we talked about him a little bit in the previous two parts so we won't labor too long uh but goran dragic you know look i know there are white side fans uh, particularly on social media who get very irritated when white side gets all the heat when someone like dragic doesn't play well and nobody talks about it so we are going to talk about it i mean goran was not good <laughs> last night at all and there are two potential theories for this uh one of which they can't help and one of which they might be able to help the one they can help is he didn't look very explosive at all. So I don't know, and I'm, again, not making excuses, but he did sit out the season finale with the knee issue, and I wonder if maybe that was bothering him a little bit last night. If that's the case, you know, maybe a couple days of rest or, or a day of rest will help that a little bit. Uh, he didn't play, I'll look at it now, but I don't think he played huge minutes last night. What did he end up with? 31 minutes. So he didn't play, it was the most minutes of anybody tied with Olenek and Winslow, but he didn't play huge minutes, but he didn't really give them anything. He was 4 of 14 from the field. He did make three threes, although I, I can't remember them now as we speak. He had four assists, four turnovers, was a minus 15. But bigger than the numbers, Chris, and this is the second issue that I don't know how they solve this, he just looks really uncomfortable when guarded by Robert Covington. Yeah. And it's it's clear that Philadelphia is going to employ that strategy for the length of this series. And you they can do that. You talk about this. They can do that because they have a six foot ten point guard. And so it when you have that who's gonna who's, who's gonna play against the other team's power forward. Correct. So that means you can take a wing and put the wing against the opposing team's point guard, and particularly when there's a wing like Covington, who is close to an elite defender, if, if he's not that, he's certainly close to it, and is always among the league leaders in deflections. We talk about steals, but his deflection numbers are always absolutely off the charts, because he gets his hands in all the passing lanes, he makes it very uncomfortable for you, even if you drive to be able to sort of get any lift and get to the basket. We know that Dragic can finish against two or three defenders, but it's a different story when he's hounded for the length of his drive by a guy with the wingspan and the instincts of Covington. And I just don't know exactly, Chris, how they free Goran in this situation. Now, again, putting Ellington in the starting lineup, which I suggested, doesn't necessarily free Goran because that's not adding another ball handler. Like Ellington is not even as good a ball handler as Tyler Johnson is. So it doesn't necessarily help in that regard. I was thinking maybe it might help just to sort of clear some bodies out of the lane a little bit if you've got Ellington lurking out there on one of the wings or they're running Ellington through some actions to at least bounce some of the bodies into each other to allow Dragic to get a little bit of space. So I might make the change to help that way, but otherwise I just don't know with the way that the Philadelphia roster is constructed what you do to get Goran some easy looks because I just don't know that he's going to get a lot of them going up against Covington. Yeah, again, I think if you can maybe try some cross-matching where you have him on the floor when someone like TJ McConnell is on, although TJ McConnell didn't play a ton, but yeah, the, the, the Covington thing is hard, man, because there was one play where Dragic beat him, right? He got past him. He, he got to the rim. He, he sort of did the, the wraparound. And Covington, because he's so long and so athletic, got there. He, like, hung in the air for, like, four seconds, extended his long arm out and blocked his shot. And what you said was so bang on, the lack of explosiveness. And I just wonder, Goran Dragic is in his 30s now, and even understanding that he doesn't have a ton of miles on him in terms of what your average high-quality NBA 31-year-old would have, let's sort of say he did play in the European Championships in the summer, and he's played a ton of games, and the entire time he's been here, it's always, "Ah, I'm a little bit injured, I'm a little bit, like, he's just someone who always has a little bit of something bothering him, and I just think that Goran 
Goran Dragic now at his age when he's not sort of at full at sort of full peak fitness, he's going to have off nights and he's going to look like a player who can't turn the corner, who can't get around guys and it's only made worse when he's going against bigger, faster, stronger. And that's what he came up against last night and Robert Covington from a defensive point of view. I will say though, because Robert Covington is their best perimeter defensive player I would say by a pretty wide margin. I mean, he got Defensive Player of the Year consideration from what I was hearing from a few of the pundits that released their ballots. So this is a high-quality wing defender. And what it does say is that Brett Brown viewed Goran Dragic driving to the rim, getting Mm -hmm. around defenders as the most important piece of that Heat offense. Even, you know, obviously... There's the other tactic in trying to, you know, uh, put off Whiteside or, or have him uncomfortable going against Smalls. So that was another tactic, but it seems pretty clear. Like Philly's scouting report was stop Dragic, stop his supply towards the rim, and you saw it work in this game. And I don't know how it changes unless they get better play from Josh Richardson too, because you know, look, Josh can handle a little bit. They can initiate offense with Josh. He's going to see a lot of Ben Simmons, who's a pretty good defender in his own right. But you're right. They're going to leave Covington on Dragic. There's no reason to make a change. There's no adjustment, I think, that Eric can make that would force Covington off of Dragic. I was looking at some of the lineup combinations. I just don't see it because you're right. There's just no one else on the Heat roster that Brett Brown fears enough that he would say, "Okay, we're going to pull Covington off of Dragic and go get that guy. Now, maybe if Dwayne's having one of those nights, right, like one of those throwback nights that they look at that a little bit, but really there's no one else. And that's why if you're Josh Richardson and look, Josh last last night in game one, one of seven from the field, oh, four from three. He was a team worse. We talk about Whiteside, right? We talk about Dragic. Richardson was a minus 30 in 27 minutes. I mean, nobody else on the team was worse than minus 16. So, again, I don't want to pin everything on Josh either because Josh has the toughest defensive assignment, and that's where most of his focus is probably going to go in this series. But he's also a, you know, a relatively skilled offensive player. They need to get more than seven shots. They need to get more productivity from him. The ball needs to be in his hands a little bit more to take the pressure off of Goran, and so maybe he can make some plays as well. That's really the one adjustment I can see with what they currently have is just to get a better Josh Richardson. But otherwise, yeah, I mean, Covington's going to hound Dragic. The other thing we know about is that Goran doesn't typically get the benefit of a lot of calls, right? I mean, he will if he's flailing up that three, right? We've seen that. He's become a master at that. But as far as when he's attacking the rim, his free throw numbers compared to guy, other guys around the league who attack the rim are not that high. So they can be physical with him also because he doesn't seem to get the benefit of the doubt there either. So again, I, I would put the ball in Josh Richardson's hands just a little bit more to allow him to attack a little bit. That's the one adjustment that maybe they can make. But this is going to be, I think, a recurring theme throughout this series is is Covington. We don't talk about him quite as much as some of the other guys on the Sixers, but he's very important to them. Yeah, and I think Dragic from from sort of trying to find these windows, trying to find the room. I mean, we saw him come out in that second half, try and be a bit more aggressive. But like you said, Ethan, and this is why I don't have much interest in, you know, saying I was right about something or whatever. But I think when you look at NBA playoff series, the reason why we talk about star talent so much is because of the concept from football, actually, which is what they call Tuesday players, which is who am I game planning for? Who am I scared of? Who do I want to not beat me? And I just don't think the Heat have enough of those guys. And Goran Dragic even as really being their guy, that is, we can't let him get going. Maybe someone thinks Whiteside is that, but maybe that was the case two years ago. I think the league has kind of figured him out, and I think the league has moved away from him too to where you're putting a lot of pressure on him to try and make a difference. Dragic is is what constitutes the best version of well, you have to be afraid of him on in-game planning and scouting, and you're trying to stop him above everybody else, and you're putting pressure on everyone else. Make a play. Figure out a way to not have Goran Dragic draw that attention, and there just isn't enough offense in this team to really make somebody do that. Let's get quickly now to part five, and I wanted to touch on that first. The Philadelphia shooting. And if look, if you're a cocky Heat fan, this is what you're, you're holding to today, is that Philadelphia went 18 of 28 from three. And that's not going to happen again. You're not going to shoot 64% on 28 attempts, okay? It was a ridiculous performance. Bellinelli was 4 of 7. Ilyasova was 3 of 4. Redick was 4 of 6. Sharich was 4 of 6. So their four best shooters were all plus 50% from three. 
probably not going to happen again. But what if you're the Heat do you do to make sure that it's more difficult? I think, and you know, and I'm, I'm going to borrow something that kind of got you in trouble a few years ago with LeBron James, you know, do it harder, work, you know, work it harder. And I think the Heat have to understand that from a defensive point of view in this series, you cannot sleep for a moment's notice. And you saw it again and again with the curls, with the pin downs, with the back cuts, all of the engineering that Brett Brown does to create quality opportunities, all of it worked last night. All of it worked. And I think that's the thing that coming up here in these next couple of games, and I trust Eric Spolster to get it done. And I think it's something that will end up changing the series because I think you saw the last of the Heat being caught out. Wayne Ellington being totally mitigated by a screen. They know, basically, in some respects, the Sixers run their offense for a majority of their team like the Heat run their offense for Wayne Ellington. So they are aware of the tactics and the way in which one would defend it. That's what they have to do, and you have to be on ready alert. And I understand the NBA playoffs is another level, man, and I I know it was the Sixers that kind of got hit with no experience and the moment might be too big for them, but I think the intensity and the play-by-play, each movement is significant. Each off-ball cut is significant. Is something that maybe in a regular season game, you don't pay for it or it's not as intense, it's not as crisp in the playoffs, it changes. And I think you saw that kind of being a major difference is do they have the crispness to every single defensive possession be ready for all their movements? And I think as the scouting report starts to come in and as you start to know what these guys are trying to do, it's going to be up to Brett Brown to counter adjust in terms of how do you figure out a way to continue to engineer those open looks because I think the Heat will be ready for them. Yeah, I think they will be uh, more ready for them than they were, certainly. And look, uh, one of the criticisms of, of Spolster defenses over the years has been the way they've guarded the three, but the numbers don't really spell that out. I mean, even, even some years where Heat fans were, were complaining so much, you'd look up and you'd be like, oh, well, the Heat are actually sixth in the league in three-point percentage defense. They're really not that bad. It just seems that a lot of it will happen on, like, one night. They'll just be yeah. one, one of those nights where everything goes in for the other side and look part of that might have just been the energy of that building and you know how up for that game they were and that it just started to steamroll here a little bit and like I said you know their four or five best three-point shooters you even throw Covington in there were all plus 50 percent from three so they were all making shots some of them were contested some of them weren't the funny thing about it is the heat shot well from three too like usually if the if the heat shoot 12 of 26 from three they'll win that game and they got it you know they got a couple from Ellington they got four or five from Olenek they got three of four from Dragic and two of two from James Johnson which is not necessarily something that you're expecting so they got pretty good three-point shooting too, just not to the level that Philadelphia was at. All right, before we go here, uh, two more quick things. One, you wanted to get into the Philadelphia fans a little bit because you saw some of that criticism coming in on Twitter. Yeah, I think it's only natural. As you start to play out a series with someone, you find reasons to hate them. That's generally how being a fan works. But one of the things that I saw was people complaining that the Sixers fans for every call, and it was Every call were hounding the officials and screaming and yelling, and people were like, well, come on, man, you're not going to get every call, and you don't think your team ever commits a foul? And I was just sort of curious, if you're a fan of a team, do you go to a game to be an impartial observer and sit around with your you know, one leg over the other with a cup of tea in hand to observe? I don't think that was the correct call, but I understand your viewpoint. That's not what fandom is. Fandom is you harass the official until you get him to sort of bend to your will, even a little bit. If it gets you a call, it will have been worth it. That is the whole point of being a fan is going there and having a go and trying to put another player off. Like that that's the whole point of being a fan. Understanding that at times it can be an obnoxious. And look, Philly fans obnoxious, unctuous. <laughs> I don't think I would like to be around any of them. Any of the other hours of the day, other than at the sporting events, when they make life difficult for the opposition and for the referees. That is their job. That is the whole point of going to a sporting event. It is an interactive experience in which you make life difficult for the opponent. That is the whole reason why home field, home court advantage exists. And so, to say, oh, I think your home court advantage was a little too strong, I, I, I thought it was odd. Well, and he fans, of course, if you take a look 
look at the most famous, one of the most famous photos of a Heat fan, it's the it's the photo <laughs> of the woman giving Joachim Noah the finger. So it's not like Heat fans <laughs> haven't engaged in some of that over the course of time. So they've done a little bit themselves. I mean, the hope is for Heat fans is maybe you get this series to 1-1 and you'd be a little bit more engaged in Game 3. But yeah, look, the thing about Philadelphia, we know what Philadelphia fans are all about. And then you also have all this pent-up frustration that they had for years. I mean, look, their process took roughly the length of the big three era, right? Like LeBron, yeah. LeBron won championships, left, came back to play the Heat three times, and Philadelphia was still going through its process. So it's understandable that they would be into it in that way, and, and we, we know that in the playoffs that things get exaggerated a little bit. All right, let's get to the final part of this, a game two prediction. You had the, the Sixers in five. Uh, I'm assuming you're, you're going to stick with them in game two? I think so, yeah. I think it, it, particularly with Embiid out, it's going to sound ridiculous, but I kind of like the Sixers right now without Embiid more than I like them with them. But I think it'll be closer just because of what I mentioned. I think there's pretty obvious defensive adjustments to make, or not even adjustments, because, I mean, obviously the coverages are, are pretty obvious in terms of what the Sixers are trying to do, but try and negate some of that off-ball movement that is going to end up coming in terms of, you know, Saric and Ilyasova and all these guys coming off screens. Those looks are too open, and I don't think Eric Spolster is going to stand for it. I think they'll be ready for it more in, in the second game from a defensive point of view. All right, my prediction is Spolster stays with the same starting lineup. I think the Heat stay in this game until the end. I think they lose a closer game in game two. I do think the Heat are going to get game three because I've just seen that turn so many times where the venue matters so much. And I think Heat fans, uh, again, not being in the playoffs last year, the building's going to be loud in game three. And, and, and we've, we've seen that, look, the Heat are full of role players and, and their role and role players in the playoffs play better at home typically. Um, yes. So, so I can see that happening in game three. I think this will be a tighter game. I think the pace will go down a little bit. I don't think we'll see. You did hear it was one of the few things in wired for sound that I found useful. Mm -hmm. uh, Eric Spolstra did say to his team, Hey, if you get a rebound and you have numbers go. Right. And there was one time where Eric Spolstra did his patented, you know, go halfway onto <laughs> right. the court in order to wave Goran Dragic on. But he did say, unless you have rebound numbers, this is our game. This is our pace. And they weren't able to exert that ability to slow down the pace. It was still, I checked of the games that were played on day one. And I think the Celtics game had come in by the time I looked at the number, but it was the fastest game of any of the playoff games so far. So mm -hmm. he did not succeed in that. Effort. No. And I think they will, they will succeed a little bit more on that in game two, but I do see Philadelphia maybe winning a game. That's a little bit more representative of what we saw in the regular season where all of those games we're tight. All right, we're going to be taping another episode right as game two ends. So we'll be putting that up overnight, Monday into Tuesday. Again, check out our Twitter account at Five Reasons. That's the number five, Five Reasons Sports. We've got chats, posts, polls, all kinds of stuff on there. One thing I didn't mention, if you get a chance, download the Live Vote app. You can do that by typing in Live Vote on either Google Play or or Apple iTunes. We're going to be eventually running some contests on there once we get enough people who've subscribed to our channel. You just subscribe to the Five Reasons channel. It is free. You'll find it there when you go on the app. And as always, you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and all of those other apps if you want to hear the podcast. Thanks a lot for listening. We'll be talking to you very soon.